Hello folks and welcome back to English 403, 503, Digital Rhetoric, Discourse and Culture with uh, me, Dr. Matt Barton. And, and this is a sort of final lecture uh, for the course, at least in terms of uh, <coughs> academic content. Uh, we'll be talking about this, um, uh, I guess, speech essay that uh, Ian Bogost has on, here on Google Talks at Google. <laughs> you know, Google must be a pretty fantastic place to work, right, if they're you know, letting you go to uh, lectures like this on a regular basis. But, you know, that is a, that's a pretty good sign, I think, just off the top of how influential and important this kind of work is. You know, basically the Google Alphabet, I guess, is one of the, probably one of the biggest companies out there, period. I mean, they, they make <laughs> maybe second only to Apple <laughs> and just in terms of revenue. Uh, so it should tell you something, you know, if they, if they think that Ian Bogost and uh, McGonagall and all these folks are important enough uh, to bring them in and then have all of their, you know, employees and executives uh, attend these lectures. That, that's a pretty good sign that, you know, somebody uh, thinks that there's some, you know, something uh, of interest here. Uh, but what is that? You know, that's what we'll be trying to dive into uh, in this lecture. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about um, just some of the background on this. Uh, so he's talking here about play, and, and these are some topics that we've talked about already with McGonagall and uh, I think it might have come up in some of the earlier lectures as well uh, where we talked about this how people tend to think about play being the opposite of work you know work is nobody voluntarily works right people only work because it's important for some reason for survival maybe or for uh, <laughs> they get paid <laughs> you know you don't it's hard to get paid to do something really fun uh, and even if you're a a professional athlete or something like that you know part of what that word professional means in that context is hey you got to get up there and do your thing even when you don't want to and when you've got other things you need to take care of you know and you don't feel like it that day <laughs> not in the mood for golf today but you know you're a professional golfer so uh, you have to go on right the show must go on um so even people in those sort of sporty you know and fun sort of activities tend to also think of there's a big difference between being a professional and being an amateur what is the difference well the amateur just does it for fun right it's <laughs> it's just not work <laughs> uh, but bogos and i think he's right and uh, the others that we talked about is saying it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try to make out like those are opposites you know why can't um you know coming back to our uh, golf example for example the professional golfer you know, it would seem a little bit weird if that golfer were to say, yes, I don't find golf fun. <laughs> I'm not playing golf. You know, I'm working. You know, you know I'm talking about working golf. Uh, you know, there, there's still some fun to be had there. And I think probably uh, it's probably true. I don't know this for sure. But the people who are really, really good at golf probably just enjoy it more, <laughs> a whole lot more <laughs> uh, than just a lot of casual folks so you know maybe even there there's a you know something to be said for it uh but bogos and again mcgonagall you know they're saying why not uh, think about homework uh, why not think about these really tedious mundane things like you know for, what the heck is with bogos to go into the mall <laughs> like, like oh it's so miserable here at the mall my little girl this is just having such a hard time with <laughs> the mall. <laughs> like, what mall are they going to? Jeez, Louise. You know, I, I, I love going to the mall. It's fun. I, I don't get it, but um, you know, I think he's got this sort of Marxist streak. <laughs> I think he's got a pretty pronounced Marxist anti-consumerism or anti-capitalism thing going here. But uh, anyway, just, just setting that aside, uh, I really liked his... Uh, the idea that even if it is just something tedious, you know, maybe you're loading the dishwasher, I thought was a pretty fun example. And I've done that. You've probably done this, too. Uh, where you're like, you know, I could just look at the loading of the dishwasher as being this hideous, boring thing. I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so you kind of put it off. Or like writing this essay for this class. But my God, who wants to write uh, an essay? You know, it's it's a high stakes thing. You know, you could, you could bomb it. Uh, and you know what's the <laughs> like the best and worst case scenarios you know, sort of play through your head and it's just you know ends up being something you don't really look forward to doing so you don't do too well um, but 
you know, if you're able to uh, leverage some of what Bo Gostier is talking about, the sort of more playful attitude towards it, you know, is there some way you can sort of gamify it a little bit, make uh, find some positive connections to it, try to find ways to make it more fun somehow, uh, and then that will almost magically, you know, not only make the task uh, less intimidating and, and easier and, and fun, but you'll probably do better on it, you know, at the, at the end of the day because you, uh, you know, you, you sort of rang that positive bell, <laughs> as they say. So I guess in, in this case it was the... Uh, going to the mall and making a little game out of the tiles, not stepping on the tiles or whatever it was. And the dishwasher, you know, sometimes I say, let me see if I can load this dishwasher uh, in like two minutes. You know? <laughs> so try to put a little time pressure on it and see if you can uh, beat your record. You know, just a simple little game like that. Uh, but the challenge is, can you bring that kind of thinking to things that do seem very familiar that you've done a million times? And still trying to look at it again with the sort of fresh eyes. And, you know, see if there's some, some room for innovation in that. Uh, so anyway, the short story, I, I think it's great stuff they're talking about here. Uh, I don't know what his deal is with malls, but other than that, uh, okay. So some of the background on this, if you want to do some uh, deeper reading. Uh, probably the classic book about this is, is, is shown here. I'm at Amazon. Looks like it's $10 or $11, I guess, for the paperback uh, version of this thing. But it's it's uh, Ho Johan Huizinga, Homo Ludens, A Study of the Play Element and Culture. And if you ever want to be anybody in game studies, you, this is like the one of those foundational books. You have to read it. Or at least you have to be able to seem like you've read it <laughs> so you can, you know, talk a few, uh, you know, give a few quotes from it or at least know the, know the gist of it. Maybe you could just read the Amazon uh, description. I mean, it's kind of a game, too. Like, uh, I remember one time I was in, I must have been like Barnes & Noble, and I was over there in the literature section for whatever reason, and I saw a book that was called How to Talk Like You've Read Books That You Haven't Read. <laughs> Or something, something like that long, silly title. Like, how to uh, talk about books you haven't read, I think was the name of the book. <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of a, to me, that's a playful element. You know, it's taking something very serious and potentially very tedious uh, and making a fun game out of it. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I, can I fool, can I sort of con people into thinking I've read all these hundreds of books, uh, you know, even though I've never even opened them? <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, he's talking here, or, or this book is about how uh, the importance of play and games and things, and again, seeing it not as something just frivolous or something that just, you know, small children do and they sort of grow out of, but actually saying it's kind of the key thing. You know, everybody has this key thing that separates uh, humanity from the animals and so on and so forth, right? And some people say it's language. Some people say it's making tools. You know, some people say it's telling stories. Uh, this book, Huizinga, he he's, says it's about these games that people are playing. And it's a pretty, you know, academic book, but you know, that, that's the sense of it. You know, it creates order out of chaos, right? It's connected with no material interest. You know, I believe this is the book. I could be getting this wrong. Yeah, this, this guy here, who I don't know how to pronounce that name, Kaloi, maybe? Uh, one of these guys talks about a magic circle uh, that where games are played. So it's sort of like this little realm of its own where it's kind of this uh, pseudo world where you can have these experiences that are kind of disconnected from the outside world. You know, it's kind of an interesting model for that. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about uh, sports and one reason they it's not this was so sad nowadays right but uh, it used to be the the field the ballpark or whatever you know was a place where you know you, you could just go and leave the politics at home <laughs> you know it's kind of this little special world where everybody's kind of wrapped up in the uh, in the sports uh, and that was you know kind of a good experience for a lot of people but <laughs> who knows what happened to that but anyway that uh concept of the magic circle uh, is in here somewhere and that's sort of been discredited uh, not just by that example but uh, 
you know, people say it's kind of impossible. Even and we've talked in here already about a lot of games do. It's kind of hard to keep the real world out <laughs> uh, of a game, no matter how fanciful you try to make it. Uh, okay, uh, moving on. Bo goes to your has a book. This is my. He's got a lot of great books. He he really is. His first book was awful. Uh, he's got one called Unit Operations, which is just <laughs> ugh. Uh, but he's got. Uh, this one, Persuasive Games. Let's see if he's got his other books down here. Yeah, he's got this one called How to Talk About Video Games. Really good. Really readable. And I guess this one's the new one, Play Anything. Uh, but this one I really like because he, this is where he talks about his concept of procedural rhetoric. So he ties us back into rhetoric is the reason why I use his work in the course. <laughs> uh, so we talked about this, I'm sure, already. You know, you, most people think about rhetoric, uh, if they don't think about it as being uh, the equivalent of deceitfulness, <laughs> they think about it in terms of being persuasive and usually in the context of giving a speech. But it goes back to Aristotle and Cicero and people like that, and they talk about the ethos and pathos and, you know, all this uh, material. Uh, this basically to help you give a good speech you know, and, and convince people that you're you know, whether you're a lawyer in a, in a courtroom or a senator <laughs> uh, or just uh, somebody who really is, is having some fun uh, being a sort of stylistic. You know, I often think about, um, you know, it's been said a few times that some of the rappers and, and hip-hop artists, especially the ones who are good at the, uh, the freestyle, that, you know, you think about a really good freestyle rapper, and we, we actually have some here at St. Cloud, very talented uh, people. Uh, this this does tie in, believe it or not. But you know, the freestyle just means that they don't have things mem they don't have a, a song memorized, and they just sort of perform it. You know, with the freestyle, the idea is you could just come to them with a topic and say, "Hey, rap about Pac-Man." <laughs> I've done this; it's fun. <laughs> you know, you try to find a topic, they're like, "There's no way they could come up with anything for this." You know, you you give them the suggestion. Uh, but forget about it. I mean, they're so good. They could pick up anything, and next thing you know, they got this fantastic, you know, professional-sounding uh, rap coming out, you know, with the lyrics uh, about Pac-Man, and it rhymes. <laughs> and everybody's just like, wow, this is amazing. And the reason uh, they're able to do that is because they have, uh, they don't have lyrics memorized, but they have certain rules that they've memorized, certain uh, rhyming schemes. They know They have a good vocabulary, for one thing. Uh, plus just being, I guess, uh, fairly well read and or at least know a lot about a lot of things so they can come up with uh, interesting examples and, uh, you know, procedures, I guess, uh, to do their uh, freestyle raps. Uh, but that's basically what Aristotle and Cicero and all them were teaching people how to do. You know, if you look at their topoi, what the, what the common topics they talked about. So the students would memorize all of these sort of templates in uh, quotes, famous quotations, lots of uh, famous historical facts. Uh, there was a book about animals. I think it was Pliny's. I forget what the name of it was. But uh, lots of stories that you could use uh, to persuade people. Like there was a, a lot of it was just made up, too. <laughs> like this idea. A lot of people still believe this. That the uh, ostrich, um, when the ostrich is scared, it like puts its head under the sand, like buries its head in the sand. That's just made up stuff from this uh, book they were using for rhetoric, you know, basically. To <laughs> so, you know, when you're trying to persuade somebody not to be scared, you could just say, well, you don't want to be like the ostrich, you know, burying its head in the sand. Uh, so that's just one example. You know, so you'd memorize all kinds of little expressions like that, uh, stories, and in that case, false. But, you know, it still serves the purpose, right? Everybody knows what you're talking about. It's kind of a vivid uh, metaphor. And so that's really what they were teaching these. Uh, basically what I'm saying is rhetoric has always been procedural. <laughs> There's always been these sort of rule-based representations and interactions. And so if you think about it that way, and it, it's frankly been, it's frankly always been a game, I would say. If, especially if you go back and look at the sophists, people like uh, Gorgias, uh, if you read uh, Plato, his works on rhetoric, he's got one called uh, Phaedrus. And you can really tell that 
a lot of there's a Aristophanes who's a comedian, <laughs> really funny too, a lot funnier than you might think. But he he's got Plato or Socrates in one of his uh, comedy plays. Socrates doesn't come out looking too good. It's almost like a Groucho Marx. It's like a Marx Brothers movie uh, in this uh, Aristophanes play. But anyway, Aristophanes shows that a lot of these uh, sophists, they're just having a lot of fun. I mean, lots of puns, lots of sort of wordplay, uh, language games. Uh, they're really having a lot of fun with their topic. And I think these uh, freestyle rappers do too, right? It's... Uh, Part of it is that playfulness with language that lets you see uh, new insights uh, about things that you might. Maybe you're kind of stuck in a rut psychologically. Uh, you kind of live in this life of tedium, right? You don't see the humor or the playfulness in a situation. So it takes somebody like that to come in and sort of open your eyes and kind of let you laugh at yourself a little bit. Uh, not take it so seriously or see everything as just, just grudge work. Uh, anyway. Uh, Bogus, though, he talks mostly here about uh, not just games, but any any type of uh, setup where you have steps to follow. And so you make something more interactive, and that adds a rhetorical component to it. And we've talked about this. I know we talked about that America's Army game, for example. It's kind of a way to, uh, it's, it's the best recruitment tool the U.S. military ever came up with. Again, not a television commercial not a song, uh, not a, a book, you know, but not a speech. You know, they've had great speeches. Look at uh, Douglas MacArthur's got a really famous speech. Uh, it's, it's a good recruitment tool. And, you know, people say the movie Top Gun was a great recruitment tool for, uh, uh, I guess, the Navy. But none of it compares to this America's Army game. You know, th that game has been more persuasive than anything. And, of course, it's through those procedures, the rules of the mechanics, whatever you want to call it, of the game uh, that make it stick. There's just a little bit more about gamification. I know we're kind of wrapping up the course, but, you know, hopefully the, I've mentioned these a few times. You have the idea of the badges. I know we talked about that last time. Uh, points. You know, you think about how much more fun it is to make points in a, you know, pickup game of basketball or uh, volleyball. <laughs> Uh, then it is in a classroom. And, you know, part of that is, you know, yeah, you do, you get points for doing uh, homework and things, but it's not really, it doesn't really feel much like a game because there's that, the punishment factor is so real. Right? It is, you know, like the stakes are so high with that. And it kind of, you kind of get, uh, again, conditioned to uh, fear failure more than you, um, you know, look forward to or savor success in these things. You know, it's a lot of students, and I've worked with many over the years, as you, you can imagine. You know, most students I talk to, they're a lot more worried about failing a class or do, or making a B, I guess, <laughs> in a class <laughs> uh, than they are. They don't really have any interest in doing really well. And there's a few that are like, yeah, I want to make an A+. Plus. You know, I really, I'm really driven. Um, but it's kind of pleasant. I, like, I love it when I find a student who says, you know, I really want to do really well in this paper. I'm really kind of excited about this topic. Um, you know, kind of wanting to be successful. Like, this is a fun thing, and I want to be the best at it. Uh, instead of just somebody who says, well, you know, my goal is just not to, <laughs> you know, I don't want to fail. I just want to get to that minimum level. You know, you know, it's it's clear they're not really seeing things as, as a fun, competitive game that, that, that they care about being good at. Well, let's see. Is there anything else here? Leaderboards. I guess you could certainly do this kind of thing. Yeah, and here's the... You see, the Wikipedia page has a pretty good page about this. Proceed, yeah, it says it's also called simulation rhetoric. That's kind of interesting. A rhetorical concept that explains how people learn through the authorship of rules and processes. The theory argues the games can make strong claims about how the world works, not simply through words or visuals, but through the processes they embody and the, and the models they construct. All right, so th there's a lot that's being said there, uh, but hopefully we've said enough at this point where you, you're starting to get the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the idea, I know we've talked about SimCity many times, and a lot. Of, I know some of you played The Sims. A lot of people like to talk about The Sims game. Um, 
you know, part of The Sims is you're buying all this furniture and, and stuff, commodities, uh, treadmills. <laughs> they, they probably got to deal with Peloton at this point. Uh, it's branded merchandise and things. Um, you know, and if you buy your Sim, you know, maybe you buy your Sims all this expensive furniture, uh, and the game makes them out to be really happy. You know, they say, oh, look, your Sims, now that you bought them this, you know, nice new TV or, you know, the... <laughs> the air fryer, you know, whatever the latest thing is. Uh, look how much happier they are. You know, and the implication there is this is the way the real world works, right? The Sims. But just to saying, like, what is Sims? You know, it's like simulation. Right? This is uh, a simulation of the real world. It's not the same as the real world. It's a simulation of it. So in other words, you know, there's connections <laughs> or there's a, it's kind of representation of it. So why not? If, you know, if buying the air fryer for your sim uh, makes your sim happy, why wouldn't buying the uh, air fryer for yourself uh, make you happy? Right? <laughs> kind of a silly example, but, you know, I don't, I, honestly, I don't think that's too far removed uh, from what Bogost is, is talking about here, that sort of uh, maneuver. And, you know, you could have made the game so that, yeah, you buy them the air fryer, and now they're sad. You should have bought them the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what solar powered stove or something I, I don't know or put them on a paleo diet now they're happy <laughs> and so who's ever making these games and deciding on you know whether it makes you happy or sad the, the sim um they're kind of constructing a rhetorical argument there about the way the uh, world works and there's even some you know, we played mcdonald's the video game in my 280 class that's one where they're trying to say that basically mcdonald's is bad <laughs> <laughs> you know, because of the game, you get ahead by doing some fairly nefarious things. Uh, there's a game called, uh, oh, what is it, Politics. Let me get the name. Yeah, here it is, The Political Machine. So they've come out with this uh, pretty regularly for every election. You know, for I guess I'm on their list because they always send me a free copy of their game. I guess they think that I'm a... As a, as a digital rhetorician, maybe I'll sell a few copies for them by mentioning it. But this, you know, I'm not going to get real deep into the, into the game here. But, you know, it's just kind of meant to be fun. It doesn't take itself real seriously. But if you really get in and start studying this, they're making claims in here. Like with the way you can get more voters and, and you advertise and you, you got these, uh, <laughs> you know, like how do you, wait, that's just making the, the face. But there's, there's something in here about yeah like you give these speeches in certain states and you can see how it says that will lower your appeal that will raise your democrat appeal uh, this will lower this uh, so somebody had to come along and say and think about this and you know who knows if what is this universal basic income so there's kind of a claim argument built into this game so that if you want to do well you might say you might support that uh issue uh, whereas if you say, come out against it, you'll lower the appeal there. Uh, so basically, it's kind of a, yes, it's a game. You know, nobody's saying this is exactly how politics work. <laughs> it's a simulation. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, it is sort of making some claims. And somebody might be persuaded by this, you know, into thinking, at least in terms of what issues are associated with what party and, you know, where you should be on, on the spectrum or, or something uh, politically. Okay, uh, I think that'll uh, just about do it here. I'm always curious what you think about all these things. You know, have you thought about being procedural? <laughs> you know, maybe next time you have the, uh, something you need to persuade somebody about, maybe you'll try to make a game uh, for it. You know, I'll just add one, one last thing here. Uh, you know, we've been talking here a lot about game mechanics, like badges and points and things. You know, even here they talk about points badges and leaderboards that seems to be the go-to for this but i think they're missing out on the big one which is uh you know they get so fixated on like the rules of a game and the game mechanics but there's also this the story <laughs> you know and a narrative and characters i mean this is part of games at least most of the games i play you know those narrative dimensions and if you study communication which probably most of you are you know there's, there's a huge movement there that they talk about make a story you know, storify something uh, 
you know, make instead of a boring PowerPoint with facts, just factual slides, you know, see if you can spin that into a narrative, because uh, that'll be a lot more persuasive, right? It'll stick in the memory a lot longer. People will be able to relate to it better. You know, if you put some people and some characters, you know, basically make a kind of a drama uh, out of it, uh, you'll get a lot more um, attention flows. So it'll be more fun. So what I like to do is say, let's come, you know, games and stories, they kind of go well together. Why not Why talk about them uh, as separate things? You know, I like to just bring them both together and say, <laughs> if you really want to make a good procedural rhetorical game, yeah, you got to make it fun in terms of points and badges and levels or whatever, game mechanics. But you also got to have a good story. <laughs> you know, um, some games there's very little story, and I guess they do okay. But probably the ones you probably like the most, you can tell me. Uh, but I'm guessing the ones you like the most probably have a really compelling story. Whether that's one that you get to create as you're playing the game, I think that's the best way. Uh, but some, you know, you're basically just reading what's going on behind the scenes as you play. But anyway, different topic. Uh, short story, I like to see both. <laughs> okay, uh, let's just wrap it up here. As always, love to hear from you. Let me know what you're thinking. And I'll see you next time.